<laughs> All right, everybody. Well, welcome to Beyond the Letter. Today's a great episode, a special, special episode for many reasons. Number one, we got Will in the house. That's hey, always hey, special when Will's on? in the house. We on? always know we're going to go viral when Will's <laughs> in the house. So we're going to at least one or two profound <laughs> clips, you know. Um, otherwise, normally we're just talking about Sesame Street or something like that. <laughs> Will, Will brings us back to earth and oh, wants to talk about the Bible. <laughs> so, <laughs> And then we got Will's boy, Jimmy, who, uh, if you didn't catch the, uh, it, us talking already, because I don't know when the team does and doesn't cut in, but Jimmy is resident pastor at Beloved yes, Will's yes, Church. Yes. So basically just uh, for those that aren't familiar with the church pounding world, residency means like... You're basically sitting in under Beloved, learning everything, catching everything you can because you hope to plant in New York, right? Exactly. Exciting. So we'll talk more about it this episode as well. And then we got the triple OG himself, my dad, Pastor Diego, a.k.a. Uh, Sheriff uh, Pastor Diego, or Chaplain. Do you call you Chap? Sheriff? Cha uh, chaplain. Chaplain? Yeah. Chaplain Pastor Diego, who is has been now officially one of the chaplains and just came from a chaplain visit wow. at a hospital. That's why we a little, little late, a little behind. Oof. So on top of all that, the fact that we have Will and my dad at the table, which is a great episode because that's I'm never nervous. happened before. I'm nervous about some uh, um, <laughs> But on top of that, Dad, just so you're aware, this yeah. episode airs mm. on April 21st. Okay. So it airs the evening for the week of the night that we have our transition service. And also, nice. you know, if someone's watching on YouTube, you will see that I have a unique hat on that's why i'm wearing it right now yep. because patriot. it's where we would have announced that we are changing our church's name to patriot, patriot. yeah yeah Very so nice. crazy which means family in greek uh, based off ephesians 3 and so um it's tonight when this airs a pretty historic night because we would have yeah. been at church service and they're delaying the the air of this by a couple hours so that you know we already share what we're going to share but for many people too if they're watching the podcast some people you know, are aware of our church, others aren't. And so that might just be an interesting conversation. The fact that after 30 years, we've navigated a, a name change. So mm -hmm. I know we don't know how you feel right now, because that's still going to happen in a week. But how you think you're going to feel after the evening of April 21st. And also that's for those contexts. It's also the night we're announcing that uh, uh, I'm kind of officially stepping into the senior pastor role at our right. church as well. So a lot of people are talking about transition nowadays and doing it well or wanting to do it well. Or so yeah. how do you think you're going to feel after next Sunday night? Well, I, I think my personality is wired that I live in the moment. So I don't think about tomorrow. So like, you know, next uh, month in May, we'll be going to uh, Italy for celebrating our 41st anniversary, me and my wife. They, are you excited? No. Are you thinking about it? No. <laughs> I live in the moment. Probably when I board the plane is when I kick in, yeah. and that's just the way it's always been. So that yeah. night will turn on the emotions, mm. and they may be everything from... Um, I don't think there's not going to be anything that's sentimental in relationship to a loss or a... Uh, a death or something not existing related to a name or uh, me not having a role or a position or a title anymore. Um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't be handing it off if I still had hesitation. Mm. If there was still reservation, either in me or in you, then it's just pretentiousness. It's just ceremonialist. There's no sincerity behind it. Uh, so all that emotion has been put to rest. It'll be the people that are in the room. It'll probably, I'm going to guess, I'm going to guess, if there's going to be a God moment where it'll just overwhelm me, it'll be the moment, and I don't know how it's going to lay out, but the moment that you and Ashley are in front of me, and I'm going to feel like an old patriarch, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. you know, handing it off to the next generation and releasing and praying and uh, turning it over to God. So that's probably going to be it. Uh, something's going to flash in me to, to, you know, whatever that was, 1985 when I started ministry and 1994 Sheesh. when I started the church. All of that will come gushing out, working a full-time job, wondering if anybody was going to show up, uh, the insecurities within myself that should I even be doing this kind of stuff. So I'm sure all of that will just come rushing out in a 
in a few minutes or whatever that is. Yeah, yeah. I'm a bit of a foreigner at this table because there's, it's a table of three church planners, and, and I'm not mm. a church planner. I believe in church pla- planning churches, of but I'm not. Yeah. I'm not a start from scratch guy like all you three guys. So if you were given some wisdom to some church planners from that start from scratch, I didn't even know, you know. Pad, y'all. <laughs> even as you were talking, I was like, you did this it in so- 1990. You started from scratch, scratch. You, you had just one financial gift, um, you know, which what, what, you know, was a great launch point. But, well, but it was a it, tithe. You know, it, wasn't a, a, it, it wasn't a large amount. No, it, it, was yeah. just, it was just a tithe. Yeah. And so I figured I had to start a church if someone was sending me a tithe. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I don't want the IRS. Well, because or... nowadays, and, <laughs> yeah. and, 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 you know, Will are leaders, Will and I are leaders in the organization, and we hope in the next year to share more about that aspect. But, you know, we're, we're starting to do some great stuff with our churches. And so nowadays, you know, because Pastor Dino and Pastor Chris Hodges and Highlands and the whole art team, they got big vision for church planning. And so, so, um, church planning is, you know, we church, we plant alone for our campuses. We start at half a million dollars, and that's like, that's not a Porsche or a Ferrari version of church planning. No. That is that is that is like the lower end. basic lower. Yeah. You know, yeah. I know other churches who church plant with two million dollars mm-hmm. to plant somewhere, and so, you know, for any church planner that that church plants with less than a hundred thousand dollars, I mean, you are you know, that's not even enough that. Uh, a venue will even look at you to yeah. lease something. That's not even enough money in the bank yeah. to, to lease something with a property that they'll even trust that you're going to make rent on, mm-hmm. on the first, you know? Mm-hmm. So, so, um, you know, we have great organizations today and, 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 uh, who help with that, but still in a regard, it, it's still super labor intensive. So you be, being in 1994, you know, starting in a living room with 12 people and then subsequently having to use faith every, Mm-hmm. step of the way at that time like what are what are a few thoughts you would give to um a church planner who really feels like hey i'm, I'm pretty much outside of mentorship and maybe you know a, a little little bit of money like i'm doing this pretty much on my own outside mm-hmm. of community so like what, what what thoughts would you give from what you've learned over the years well i i think very important back then was that i truly truly had a pastor somebody I could call my pastor. Mm. And I, I, I'm just, of call it my generation, call it my, my convictions, whatever you choose to want to call it. I just believe that every pastor ought to have a pastor. And that would slash be his spiritual father when, when you look at the characteristics. Somebody that encourage you, but somebody that rebuke you. Somebody that will co- pull your coattail and somebody you can ask, you know, how do I deal with a rebunctious uh, member to a staff member? What do, who do I hire first? How do I buy a building? Uh, so that was very important for me to establish a pastor. I, I Because so many people feel alone. Hmm. You know, we feel alone. I mean, thank God for our wives, but there's just a loneliness that we possess that's not shared. But if you have somebody that um, you could call a pastor, and I, yeah, you could have a mentor and a colleague and all, all those kinds of things that you can gleam light from. But I just think there's something about a pastor that, uh, that honors authority that God honors your house with. Yeah. And to me, if you, if you don't do that, then, then who knows? I, I don't know what will happen. So uh, I, I think having a pastor um, was, was really huge. Um, I worked uh, for a year and a half a secular job. Uh, the church couldn't afford me. I did not want to bleed the church of its finances. I wanted to be an example to that congregation. So uh, I worked a year and a half. Some people are afforded the privilege of not doing that. Uh, I did it, so uh, uh, I like what it did in me. Hmm. I like what it did in me. I identify with people that are going to work full-time jobs and then volunteer X amount of hours a week or give to the Lord. And I, I think it required me to exercise my faith, to have um, the energy. I mean, you, I worked sometimes 16, one time I worked 20 hours a week and still start in this church to say, Lord, now I need a sermon. 20 hours in one day. Well, 20 mean, hours in one day, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. 16 hour days and then one time I worked 20 hour a day. And then, to, and then to go ahead and now have to figure out what I'm gonna preach <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> so uh, you, you learn to believe God 
and him to grace you with the sacri- sacrificial life that you're living. And if you don't have all that and everything, and don't get me wrong, if everything is just convenient, everything is comfortable and everything is handed to you, then when do you develop that character? When do you develop that testimony, that faith, that now come hell or high water in the future, I know how to believe God because we went through difficult times. Mm. Mm-hmm. So I, I would say that, that that was a catalyst for me to be able to do that and then to really appreciate when that time came after a year and a half when the church was financially strong enough to be able to hire me full time and just yeah. the, the privilege and the gratitude of uh, not having to go to work at a third shift, which I was doing at midnight or two in the morning. Uh, that I'd have normal hours again. Yeah. So uh, that was really, really important for me. And uh, I just think that not putting a whole lot of pressure on yourself is huge. Mm. Just, it, you know, everything just seems to be volatile. Everything just seems to be, if we don't get this thing right, it's not going to happen. And I, I just think God is in in his calling and in who the calling on our lives and in, in uh, his church his body, it's it's stronger than our insecurities and in our inadequacies. He makes up the difference. Yeah. So, if you you know if you don't preach a great sermon, it, it's okay. And you know what, you didn't have a, a great altar call, it, it, it's okay. And you know you weren't as loving as Jesus was and compassionate by being in the room when somebody was going through a tough time, but we're so busy, you didn't pick up the phone, you, you, you didn't give them the right words, it's okay. Um, so don't put a lot of pressure on yourself mm. kind of thing it was real important. And then the, basic, the basics is I was always very disciplined from day one with the mi- li- minimum time I had to have devotions. They were uncompromising. They were just uncompromising. I'm, I'm not the sharpest pencil in the bunch, uh, so I couldn't rely just strip, strictly on charisma or talent or gifting. I really needed to depend on the Holy Spirit, and that's where um, my <clears throat> prayer life came hmm. uh, in. And so I established that from day one that, you know, it, it varied in time and it varied uh, in um, the amount of time, but it was always there. It was it was just simply always there. So, Was there, like, especially in the early years, like moments where you're like, I don't know if we're going to make it through this or like, I don't see a path forward. Have you ever felt that? And if you have like, how did you get through those like discouraging like times as like the early five years of the church plant? Yeah. I, I, I think everybody deals with, with doubt, uh, self doubt, uh, that the enemy can prey on within our insecurities of, of our past kind mm-hmm. of thing. Then I think there are spiritual attacks mm. that the enemy can bring into into our lives, but I think that for me, there there was no question I was called. Mm. That has never, I have never doubted that I. I mean, whether you affirm me or didn't affirm me, whether the offering was good or the offering wasn't bad, uh, not good, mm. whatever it was, I have never mm. questioned the call on my life, and I think that that wow. is a game changer. <laughs> That gets you through it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I mean, if he calls, does he not equip? Did he not see this day of tragedy or difficulty right now? Is the is the calling limited? Is the calling my calling or is the calling his calling kind of thing? Mm. So ultimately, yeah, there was self-doubts on could I uh, exposit the scriptures in the way that they should be exposited? Mm. Uh, could I fundraise... Um, the amount of money that was expected or, or needed. Um, could I uh, pastor people that were highly educated or marketplace leaders? Or uh, So there were always those self-doubts, but uh, knowing that I was called, hmm. that was never a doubt. And, and wow. that just, you know, yeah, so say, am I called to, mar- to be married to Cindy? Yeah. Okay. Then are you going to make? It, then you can make it through the difficulty. You can make it through the, mm. the, 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 you know, the trials or whatever you're going through. You're called to be her husband. You're called into this marriage. So, that's what really sustained me. I yeah. just maybe call it stupid <laughs> faith or dumb. I just was called because it was so radical. Yeah. It's a. 
And I think everybody has that. They just have to see it that way as a Damascus Road experience. Hmm. Somebody just didn't pray you into this. Your mama just didn't say you were called, uh, you know, or some spooky people said some things over you or you needed a job or you need affirmation or anything like that. Uh, no, there's a Damascus Road experience where you see the provident, providential hand of God, how he just turned you 90 degrees, put you in a place, and it was divine. Mm. And I think that all through our lives, these are what I call God's breadcrumbs. He's leading you. But so many people want, like Elijah, the spe- or the, pe- the, the pe- person that wanted the spectacular miracle to take place, or the fire and the lightning and all that kind of stuff. And I just think it's God's breadcrumbs that are in front of you. Make those breadcrumbs a loaf of bread because they're important to God, and he mm. is speaking through those breadcrumbs. Mm. So why would you demand a loaf of bread, miracle, voice from heaven, mm. God, give me the Sinai experience mm. when mm. God's saying, I've given you enough. Just go ahead and obey me. Do what you're Sheesh. doing. Yeah. Like I, I just want to ask because I don't know if you guys ever had this. Um, now that transition's coming, now you see your son, and make it plural, your sons, right? All of them kind of working together. You, 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 like Moses, you pioneered and you did all this. When you see Adam and Ashley, like what happens in your heart? What's like your inner dialogue with God? as you're seeing your son step in to take leadership of this church. Like, I'm just so curious, right? Because oh. I feel like me, Adam, and Jimmy, we have kids. I have a son. I have daughters. Yeah. And my wife and I joke around. My wife's always like, she's going to be a pastor. I'm like, nah. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, I don't want her to be yeah. a pastor because this is just. But like now that you're on the other side where we hope to be 30 years from now, when you see your son stepping in, what's that inner dialogue with God? Well, it, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a joy. It's, it's an honor. Uh, it's a privilege. Mm. Um, and I hope that all successors have that in them, that it, it's not competition. It's not envy. It's not jealousy. Um, it's not apprehension or, or, or fear, or whatever it is. I mean, it is really... You know, I want this thing to go right, and I believe this is the right person, and I'm going to do mm. everything in my power to get out of the way mm. uh, physically, emotionally, opinionly. Uh, I don't even know that's a word, but, <laughs> 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 uh, uh, you know, out of the way. So, um, you know, I, there's a lot of questions or responses I could give to you, Will, because this has been a, a, a seven-year process yeah. of evolution. Yeah. So what emotion I had seven years ago is a different emotion today and vice mm. versa. But when when the board came and we decided that, God forbid, if I was to die tomorrow, who would I choose to be the successor? And I said, uh, Adam would be the successor, but he's n- I'm not saying he's the official successor. Mm. It's just in a crisis emergency situation, I would like him to step in. Mm. And I told him that mm. you're not. Because I wasn't sure, I wasn't sure yet of mm. that. But I had, that was probably my first inclination of having to say something or choose mm. who, who that will be, even though it was still a long ways off. Then as he began um, developing and maturing and all those things, his, his gifting, his intellect, uh, his talent, his charisma, uh, were checked off the boxes. Mm. Could he could he carry the mail? Could he hold the room? Uh, was his marriage fit? Uh, was he you know all those kinds of things that we would we would look at his character and all those those boxes were were being checked. But there was still one thing that was in my heart, mm. uh, and that was was he truly a pastor? Mm. I wasn't going to hand this off to somebody who was not a pastor within his calling Mm. and someone that would use this church and it'd be a platform and he'd be here for a season and start his own ministry or manipulate it in any way or, uh, you know, was he just an amazing communicator, Mm. but he didn't hold people's hands when they were hurting. He wouldn't visit them. He wouldn't counsel them. Mm. Uh, He wasn't here Monday through Friday Mm. uh, with the hurts of the ministry, not just the celebrations of the ministry. So um, 
It, I, I was praying to God. This you asked about my relationship. I was praying to God. I need to see this. Mm. I, 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 it's my like my last box to check off. I don't, I don't see it yet, and 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 I'm I'm not sure that I should be doing this if mm. I don't see it. Mm. Um, so I'll never forget. It was a, a night where we had water baptism, mm. and he was in the tank, mm. and somebody and I, I had a direct. I was directly in front of him outside the tank looking at him for some reason, mm. just caught it at that moment. Somebody in front of him that was going to be baptized was weeping and crying. Mm. And he put his arms around that person before he baptized them and he hugged them. Mm. And then he baptized them. And I felt like God said, there it is. He's mm. a pastor. Mm. He's a pastor. Wow. So he'll care for the flock. He'll protect this church. Mm. He'll protect it. So once that was, then it was like sailing high. You know, it was like, okay, let me, let me get out of the meetings. Let me not be in our HR anymore. Let me not be in the financials anymore. Uh, you That's know, it's crazy. Yeah. I and mean, this is so uncommon. Yeah. It's so, yeah. I was just on the phone on the drive here with a very close friend of mine, spiritual father's lead pastor, founding pastor. And you know, he's our age, but he's, he's, he's having to leave because there's no space mm -hmm. and he was we're just yep. i was just encouraging him and he's just like you know he raised me up he poured into me but he's just not a releasing or empowering leader and yeah. he's like my heart is broken but i gotta i gotta do, f f obey my calling to yeah. be a pastor and a church planner so he's pretty much just being more or less being pushed out like in the way that there's no space no more mm -hmm. you know and that's that's the norm like that's the norm that's my been my experience yeah and then to put on top yeah. of that father son that's just another level of humility, yeah. love, compassion. I, I mean, it's just crazy. Yeah. You know I mean? For the longest, I thought I thought that's what it, how it was going to have to be for me, just because, um, uh, like, when I was younger, and I'm, you know, different now, but, but when I was younger, I was very different from mm. the average pastor and person in ministry and stuff like that. Like, I, you know, was working in marketing and all these other things, and... And stuff like that, and so and and I and there were other people at our church that were far more uniquely, in a natural element, gifted than I, and you would even say called, you mm -hmm. know, in that sense. And um, they they were less um, controversial in their approach. They really assimilated well, and mm -hmm. you know, were on stage well, and they never shook a box or anything. So. For the longest, I mean, I would spend weekends in Los Angeles just looking at homes and stuff with Ashley because I'd be like, yeah, one day we're going to church plant. And I wow. I just made a promise. I said, I'm here as long as my dad's here. So I'm just here to support him. So mm. the day he retires, I'm like, out. I'm out. That'll be my last day. So whether it goes to one of my brothers or he, there were a couple other pastors on staff that were very, very, very uh, great preachers and other th leaders and people, you know, would hang around them and... Mm. And so I was just like, that's, that'll be the future. Like, mm -hmm. you know, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, whatever it is, however long my dad wants to do this, the day he goes, Hey, here's my runway. Here's my next guy. I'll go sit with him and we'll say, Hey dad, we're, we're out. Mm -hmm. And whether I'll, you know, and we, so me and Ashley, I mean, I had prepared her for that. And then the whole time she kept on like, no, you'll like, you'll take over for your dad one day. The, the wife and, usually and I'm like, knows. They're the prophets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they and I, know your And destiny. really, honestly, and I wasn't saying it in like a bashful way. It was really like, no, you're crazy. Like, there's no way. Yeah. You know, there's there, there's no way. It's just you're crazy. That that wouldn't happen. So I had kind of always prepared myself that, um, you know, like church planners probably do, is like, you know, you go on Zillow and you're looking mm. at, you know, <laughs> what's for rent or what's for lease, what are prices like? And I was just always doing that. I was always doing that in LA. I was always doing that in maybe in other places. We go on vacation somewhere and I'd be like, oh, this is a cool place. Maybe mm. we do a church plant here one day. Maybe we, you know, and you just would always talk about it. And so mm. I, for the longest, I thought that was what the future was going to be. Mm. And then, uh, and then um, when my dad did finally tell me I was, uh, and he said it in the way that he said, he said, Hey, I just want to let you know, I, you know, I had talked to the board. If anything ever happens to me, you know, you, you would, you would leave the church. <laughs> but I also think that there's potential one day that if I retire, you would be the person that I would want to pass it to. And I was just like, I was really 
you know, <laughs> that's crazy. I didn't know what to say. <laughs> and I remember, I remember the conversation. We were, he had bought two cho- chocolate labs who are now, how old are your chocolate labs? No? Uh, eight years old. Something yeah. Like that. So we were going to pick them up as puppies from the airport because he bought, got them from like a breeder out of state. So we're going to LAX and he, he texted me and he asked me if I would come with him. And I said, yeah. So we were in his truck on, on the way to LAX. Uh, to pick up his dogs, and and that's when he had the conversation. And at the time, my wife and I had been leading a Sunday night service here, and it had gotten really successful. That was called Fresh Start, and um, uh, I had asked probably maybe 90 days prior if I could shut it down, and I said, because, you know, I I feel like it's causing division uh, Mm -hmm. amongst young people and older people because Mm -hmm. young people are going to my service, old people are still staying at your service, and then my dad kind of responded and said, well, uh, if you shut it down, why don't you come on the leadership team and start helping influence the church the as church. a whole? And that, But that wasn't like an executive level thing. That wasn't like a big lead. It was just like, like why don't you just kind of have a seat on the table, mm. you know? Um, and at that time, my oldest brother, like he's on the board, he's running as an executive role and all that kind of stuff like that. And so... Um, Really, but when we went on that drive and he said that, Ashley had kind of just always prepared me. Like, if your dad ever That's has crazy. that conversation, like That's your crazy. your answers your answer is going to be yeah, yes, yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah. And I was just like, first of all, that conversation would never happen. Mm. Uh, second of all, um, I don't know that my answer would be yes. I don't want to mm. burn the place down, you know. Mm. So so it was just I have a high high respect and value mm. for the sacrifice my dad has made over yeah. thirty years and. The sacrifice a lot of people have made sure. uh, to build a community over thirty years, and so it was just kind of like I'm. I don't want to. I'm not going to be that guy. But when he told me on the drive, I just. Um, I think I said something like, "I don't see it in myself, but if you see it in me, you know, I'll tell <sighs> you. I'll tell you yes Oof. for now. <laughs> you know, emotional. I'll say yes, <laughs> but you know, like Oof. you know, but yeah. I I trust you. You're my dad. I, if you see it in me, then. Then, and he said, uh, you know, I basically want to start um, pouring into you and developing you in wow. that. Because for the longest, for the first couple of years, it, he would just publicly say, my sons, my sons, my sons. So he'd say plural, mm. plural. And then that day it switched to, um, my, you know, Adam, mm. Adam, Adam, and not just my sons in that regard. And then he had said, I, you know, I still got to talk to your brothers and let them know. But what he didn't know was in the midst of me doing that Sunday night service, they both of my brothers independently sat me down and just said, hey, I think one day dad's going to uh, ask you to lead the church. Because wow. for those listening, they may not know. I have two older brothers. Yeah. They're, they're older than me. And so uh, I'm, the, I'm the youngest. So they independently sat me down and said, you know, I just want to let you know if, if dad ever asks you to lead the church, we're, we're on your team. We have no problem staying with you, and, and we want to rock with you. And, I was, and I'm like... And then that's what I was, no, you take it. You know, we'd always do it like, and then honestly, we would all just be like, we'd always be looking for people to suggest to my dad that sure. he pass it to. Because if you grow but, up in this, just like you did with your daughter, you're yeah, like, yeah. nobody wants it. Yeah. If you really know how much of a sacrifice this is, none of, for me and my sure. brothers, we never, I know other churches, some siblings, they do fight over it. Like none of us ever, we, we'd literally tell each other like, hey, what do you, you know, let's just use, Aaron wasn't part of the conversation because I brought Aaron on my team. But as an example, I'd be like, hey, dad, what do you think about Aaron <laughs> leaving? You know, like, he's pretty dope, huh? Like, could you see him leading the church one day? And, you know, something like that. My dad would be like, what? No, I don't, what are you talking about? You know? <laughs> Did you, you know how your dad, Pastor Diego, had that moment yeah. during the baptism? Did you have a moment when you were like, okay, like, okay, God, like, I'm going. Like, this is, yeah. I'm scared, I have doubt, but did you also kind of have one of those moments? Well, I had a moment that uh, I was personally validated as a pastor uh, years prior when my wife was doing I would have never said yes if I didn't view myself as a pastor, because yeah. I hadn't. Sure. I hadn't viewed myself as a pastor since then. I had the title, but like, we've, you know, it's been talked about before, you know, we have the fivefold ministry, right? Mm. It's best in America today that anyone that operates in the fivefold ministry should call themselves a pastor yeah, because yeah. there's been so much abuse in the, in America. Yeah, so yeah, if you're yeah. an evangelist, just call yourself a pastor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, if you're a prophetic, just call yourself a pastor because there are too many people who are abusing prophet For and sure. evangelist For and all sure. that. And so I had just, so title wise, I had believed I was a pastor because I had believed that I was 
uh, uh, an evangelist. At the time, I didn't know I had an apostolic gift, mm -hmm. but I had believed I had an evangelistic gift because mm -hmm. I believed in like really helping my dad seek the lost, mm -hmm. which was my style. I had tattoos, was very aware of culture. My degree was in apologetics. So that I knew. So it was like, yeah, I'm an, I'm an apologist. I'm an evangelist which isn't really a shepherd, mm -hmm. you know? So, so I, that for me, I would have never said yes to my dad if I didn't feel that I had the empathy mm. to cry with people and walk with people and, mm. and uh, grieve with people and all those type of things like that, pray for people, even be aware of what, you know, the gifts look like, especially mm -hmm. at our church who leans more charismatic. Mm -hmm. So when I was leading Sunday nights, that was a season where, um, you know, for me, I personally discovered uh, speaking like, in tongues, uh, uh, and I and I uh, discovered more what it means to lead in a very personal way. Me and my wife had to, for the first time, pastor adults because I'd always been a children's pastor and youth pastor. Mm. And with children's pastoring and youth pastor, you're not really pastoring them. Yeah. You're you're uh, pouring into them. You're more of a missionary. Yeah. You know, you're like continually pouring, and you're hoping in the next ten years you'll see fruit from yeah, it. Yeah. Whereas when you start pastoring adults, yeah. it's a lot more. Uh, you get more feedback yeah, early yeah, yeah, on, yeah. whether you're doing good or bad job. You just get that yeah, immediate yeah, feedback. Yeah. And so, um, leading up into that point, I I had when I when me and Ashley were stuck with completely developing a team walking with people, pastoring with people, mm. discipling people, marriage, hospital visitations, funerals. That's when I had felt like, oh, I, 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 I'm not, I'm not just uh, a behind the scenes guy. Cause mm. I had, I'd convinced myself I'm like really good at behind the scenes. Mm. That was and a very that affirming was season. For yeah. You, yeah. That was adult. like a, that was a season where it was uh cause we were having all type of people coming, you know, older people, younger people. And so that for me, and then just then over the years, um, yeah. I think the, the most, the, if I had an insecurity, which I did, uh, the insecurity would have been, um, um, I don't want to fail this place. Mm -hmm. You know, that was the insecurity, not pastoring I, I, or shepherding. Like I, I had saw that he needed to see that in his own regard, but, mm -hmm. but you know, my dad's not with me every day. So yeah, he's yeah, not yeah, with yeah. me when I'm at home taking phone calls with people or he my, you know because of the church's size, we're not, we don't see each other day to day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like I may be doing a funeral for someone, a child, and he doesn't know, mm -hmm, you know, so mm -hmm. he's not, he, he, we're, and I'm not fully aware of what he's doing on a day to day. Mm -hmm, right. Mm -hmm. So that, that's going to happen. But for me, it was like, it was like, man, he's so good at this. Mm. Like he's so good at leading this. Mm. Um, I would never want to start leading it. And then it just go like the plane just goes, <laughs> It just goes like the propellers just stop moving. Yeah. And that is what I think uh, the Lord had to show me. That was like, you know, you, you got, you can have, you can have greater days, mm. you know? And, um, and so Sheesh. I didn't think that, that was the case. I just thought it was a prayer. Like, God, could you give us greater days? But it was kind of an, I had kind of felt like if I take it, uh, I'll probably manage wherever we're at. And then we'll just slowly decline. You know, like <laughs> <laughs> this is this is you powerful know? for people to hear and for people to understand. Yeah. And then your congregation after the ceremony and the transition to even see like how real and authentic this transition has been. It's not just how oh, we just did this overnight. It's like years upon years, if not yeah. decades, of praying and wrestling and discerning. And right. even Pastor Diego, there's so much like most people. Not most. A lot of times there's like nepotism. But when I hear you, that's a complete opposite. It's mm -hmm. like, I love God. And I want this to be God honoring. And obviously I love Adam. But the way you even wrestled through it is like, I want the right person to step into the role for what God is doing versus what I want, my legacy. Because that's not even just, your yeah. wiring is not even yeah. about that. It's more like yeah. kingdom. So even me hearing this, I'm yeah. like, wow, this is... And really he didn't powerful. want any of us going into ministry. My dad begged me to get a business degree. <laughs> he was like, please, just major in business. And I was like, no, I'm going to major in theology. He's like, no, no, no. You know, like, he's like, you may end up in ministry one day. That's great. But I'll have a fallback. Focus on, you know, business. Look at that. Like, yeah. his idea was like, I want, you know, I want you guys to leave. Go to college. Like, I didn't go. Be successful. Like, this ministry grind is like not for the faint of heart. And it was just kind of, it was we, like, we never sat down, had long conversations about it, but there were like little hints of yeah. like, don't no, don't major in theology, major in <laughs> business. Don't, you know, like, and then he's like, even if you end up in ministry one day, your business degree will help. Like, yeah. but don't, you know, and I'm like, no, I want apologetics, you know, and it's like, 
It's basically like, well, okay, your only option is ministry from that point on, right? So it, he was never like, um, it was always in his house. You had to serve, you had to go to church, all those type of things like that. But that was just teaching us how to be responsible Christians. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. never like preparing us to be a pastor, to be in ministry. ministry or anything like that. Nathan, Nathan, my oldest brother, is he has a, a master's in education, so he he wanted to be a, a like a school principal one day. Mm. So he was going to start as a teacher, and then he wanted to move up to uh, the faculty at like a at like he wanted to be in the in a district, and mm. he wanted to be a like a, a superintendent or whatever like that. And so he had no plans mm. of going uh, into ministry till our school at our church adopted a school. And my dad was like, hey, your your degree may help this relationship between the church and the school. Mm. And then just Nathan, by proxy, kind of being a, around ministry, the only one who had, like, kind of knew at young, like, you know, 17, 18, whatever, that they were going to go into ministry or be a pastor. It was my middle brother, Caleb. Mm. He was the only one that was mm. like... Yeah, that's that's what I, I want to do. You the know? way you talk about ministry is so beautiful because it sounds more like an inheritance, whereas a lot of the pastors that I talk to when they think about their kids going into ministry, it sounds like a curse. <laughs> like, I would never want my child to enter into that. So it's yeah. beautiful to see, and just myself thinking through it because I have a daughter as well. She's two years old, and I'm just like, oh, I don't know if I would ever want this for her. Yeah. But you you see it as an inheritance. What was it in like your dad's fathering and pastoring that – didn't drive you away from it, made you attracted to it? Um, I, you know, I think the first, what I've always told people is number one, uh, the only, really what even led me to the Lord and even led me to like stay in church was, uh, my dad's character. So he, who he was on stage is who he was at home. And mm-hmm. so that never changed. Whereas from, from what I know from a lot of other pastor kids is like, they would always make jokes and be like, you know, my dad's so phony on stage because when he gets home, you know, the way he talks to us or the mm-hmm. way he talks to my mom or the way that he's, you know, acts omnipotent or whatever that is like. Um, so a lot for a lot of times that keeps them away from even looking or. And so um, my dad and any of us like being Hispanic, he just had a he's had a hard work, a, a very heavy work ethic. Yeah, it's just different levels. So um he gives himself to the job 100%. So I, growing up, I like, he'd be gone a lot. So that could be an easy way to be mad at the church or anything like that. But within all of that, he wasn't afraid to like, he'd bring us along, you know? So like, I remember growing up, like he'd, he'd do a job interview. I specifically remember one time he did a job interview after a Wednesday night service at Coco's I don't know if you remember that. It was one of the worship wow. leaders. I can say who it was, but he did a job interview at Coco's. Okay. Uh, the other brothers, my other brothers went home. Okay. And then you and then, and then then you asked me, what do you want to do? Do you want to go home or do you want to go with me to this interview? Mm. And then I was like, oh, I, I'll go with you to the interview. And then I just sat at Coco's and then I just listened to my dad. Like, <laughs> yeah. I remember I had like a soup or something like that. <laughs> and I was maybe like 10 or something like that. And then I, and then I just heard my dad like, and what he was saying though was like, how are you going to love our people? How are you going to, like, he wasn't asking questions about, like, talent or skill. Uh, My dad already saw that. He saw that they were gifted. And uh, it was a worship leader, uh, Adam. Um, um, oh. And so uh, so he's there, and, he, and, like, my dad's asking questions about, and, like, showing how much he loves the people and loves, like, it. nothing, nothing of it was, like, the systematic nature of the church. It wasn't, like, c- can you handle following my lead? Can you... You know, if I cancel one of your songs day of, are you going to be okay? Like, he wasn't asking anything like that. He was asking about, like, how's you and your wife? What's your guys' marriage like? Mm. Um, what You know, like, it was just, it was stuff that was care intensive. Wow. And so I've never, I've never grown up. I've seen ministry abuse outside. I've never grown up and seen ministry abuse mm. in, in, in my highest leader. Mm. I've seen it with maybe mid-tier pastors and leaders. Um, but even then, I've seen my dad, like, absolutely let them go in minutes if mm. they've abused the sheep mm. or, or abused a staff member or something like that. So I've seen the cutthroat nature, like, and I've heard it from my dad, don't mess, don't hurt the sheep. He says that in staff meetings. He says that in, like, he's like, I will wolf you if you hurt the <laughs> sheep, you know? like I got the rod it, for you. Yeah. <laughs> I got the staff for And you're for just them. like, <laughs> oh, dang. Like, so I ne- I've never, I never have, I've, I've heard of ministry abuse outside, I've seen it outside. Like I never, I've never grown up 
from the highest leader and ever seen yeah. any form of yeah. that type of abuse. So for me and all our brothers, it was just like, yeah, we went like, it always just started more so with like, we validated, we knew we had a call, but then it also came with, but we could exercise our call anywhere. I could yeah, go, yeah. I could go work here. I could go do this. I could go do that. I go work for this church. But the moment we validated a call, it was just like, man, we should help dad. Cause like he, you know, it, it, you know, at 22 years old, um, you know, he's, he's making a couple like LGBTQ jokes on stage. <laughs> And then I come to it, and I'm just like, hey, Dad, is it, like, it's not really cool. I had some young adults, like, in our... It's a different yeah, generation, yeah, Dad. Yeah. I don't know if you remember that. And I was just like, I had some people in my small group, and, like, they were really hurt because they just felt like it was really, like, insincere and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So my dad goes, okay, well, hey, let's do this. From here on out, if I ever talk about LGBTQ, how about I talk to you and three other young adults first, get their feedback before I ever share something on the pulpit again? And it was like we've all been in church yeah, long enough. Like you don't, sure. from a guy in his fifties and sixties, you don't hear 100%. him telling a 22 year old, like, yeah, next time I'll, I'll call you and I'll double check. No, yeah. what they'll say is they're just sensitive. Tell yeah. them to get over it. You don't know if what they don't, if they don't want to, you know, yeah. if they can't handle that conversation in church, then they don't love the truth. And if they don't love the truth, then that, that, that this church isn't for them. They're just gonna sure. have to go find a church that, you know, like that's, we've all heard something like that before. Right. Exactly. It's like, I didn't hear, I've never heard that kind of stuff yeah. before. Now he's like, he's passionate and he like, he can be cutthroat, but it's never been about a lack of care or compassion. It's about the, just the passion for whatever the, whatever the task is, yeah. you know? So, so for us in terms of the beauty of serving people and the church and just each of us being aware of like where our gift fits with that, um, I always knew it was hard work and I always knew it was a burden, but I, I never really thought that it was like a curse, you know, right. because it was, it, it, I, I have been able to see over the years, so many healthy people and families come out of this where sometimes some churches, it's like a lot of ruins in the back of like, you look, you, you turn behind and it's just, yeah, bodies, bodies and ruins everywhere. and, yeah. you know, and then, and then, so then you're just like, are we really doing any good here? Are we really helping people? Like I've never, I've never had that thought come yeah. to my mind, you know, yeah. um, or, you know, um, like, yeah, I feel like if someone asked me if my dad was a great leader, I feel like I'd have to lie, you know, like, cause mm -hmm. like, you hear that. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but I've never felt like I've had to, to do that. I had a great example of it. So if God would allow me, like, why would I, would I why would I not want to help continue, yeah. uh, what he built? And I made sure I did everything I could to make sure, um, it wasn't some type of nepotistic thing. Mm -hmm. Like I went to school, I studied yeah. the Bible. I've done everything I needed to do in a traditional yeah. way, right? You're um, like, I don't want this role. Yeah, I don't Dad, want please, this role. Don't right? do this to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I tell people all the time, I'd be happy with a church of 500. For sure. Be happy if that's what the Lord wanted me to do, because it's a massive blessing to 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 be able to do that and church plant in that regard. Yeah. I'd have been, I'd man, I go to our our campus plants that are much smaller. And I go, it's amazing. I love this, yeah. you know, but, but, you know, I do believe God has different, you know, desires that he wants. And, and I think one of the desires he was wanted for our church was to be, uh, um, to be, uh, to be an influencer to, and help other churches that sure. maybe may look a little bit more like us that for are sure. uh, more minority based person of color based. So, so I think for us, God has wants us to maintain our size and composure, not not because size matters today, but I think God wants us to have an influence for sure. uh, to help other churches and, and steward, pastors. Steward your yeah. guys' kingdom influence and yeah. everything you guys sowed into now that you're reaping. You know, Because yeah. for me, being on this side, two and a half years in, he's launching a church next year. I think seeing you guys, I tell this to Adam all the time, it's a, it's a tension sometimes when I come to places like this, mm. where in one sense I'm so inspired, mm -hmm. and the other side of the coin I'm so discouraged. Because mm. I look at, I go back home and I'm like, man, my, my podcast is just my iPhone. Hey, what's going on, everybody? <laughs> or like, we're in a movie theater, setting up, tearing down, or our volunteers, we don't got money for this and that. And I'm sending you churches for sale on Sunday Yeah, this dude's, this dude's always <laughs> like, hey, bro. So I'm like, yo, Adam's my boy. He's looking out for me. I'm like, I don't got $8 million, dog. I got like $10,000 over me. But, like, but at the same time, like God's been encouraging me because I've been discouraged. This past, I was even telling Adam this last time. I was like, past month, I've been a little discouraged because yeah. church is not where 
I want it to be, mm-hmm. things are not where I hoped it to be. And at the same time, I ask myself, am I made for this? Mm-hmm. And then I just come back to it like, God, you call me to this. Mm-hmm. This is not about being successful. This yeah. is about being faithful. Mm-hmm. This is not being about being a great leader. Mm-hmm. This is about pastoring the people he sent me. And I just keep reminding myself, I didn't get into this to be successful. I, can't, I, I came into this to obey God's calling in my life, you know? And I think the strength of the generations before us, like your generation, I was talking to a mentor of mine once and I was like, cause before I planted a church, I was like, hey pastor, like, I, what do I need to prepare and get ready for to plant a church? It's so old school, but it, was, it really encouraged me. It was like, all you need is a Bible and a guitar. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, you could have dropped me off anywhere in the world. If I had a Bible and a guitar, I could start a church. <laughs> and he was kind of like a gentle rebuke to me. Yeah, yeah. He's like, okay, resources are good. The church planning networks are great. The denominational support is great. He's like, you got the calling. Don't even worry about those things because the call of God's on your life. It's, it's going to all work out. I was just reading this morning, it was like Ezra 3, and I just keep saying the hand of God was upon Ezra. Mm-hmm. The hand of God was upon Ezra, mm-hmm. right? He studied the law, he taught the law, he lived the law, and the favor of God. And this morning I was reminding myself, God, if you're with me, we good. Like, yeah. Think about Joseph. Yeah. He's in prison, God is with him. He's in slavery, God is with him. He's in Egypt, God is with him. And I think that's, what sometimes our generation, because now we have resources, now we have training, now yeah. we have connections, but we don't got the favor of God. <laughs> so these things yeah. may fake it, yeah. but you might last three years, five years, and you might trick yourself and everyone else because you're succeeding, but it just yeah. kind of like crumbles, right? Yeah. So just seeing you guys and seeing Abundant, now Patriots, it's remarkable. I yeah. think because I'm an outsider insider yeah. now because I've been around the family here, yeah. but like yeah. as an outsider, it's like it's beautiful, man. It's and I just want to encourage you, Will. I think if again, if everything is handed to us, and I can't come from that world, because, I mean, I can't speak to it because I wasn't in that world where I was guaranteed a certain amount of people, and I was mm-hmm. guaranteed a certain salary, and I was guaranteed a building, or or everything like that. Um, th- this is your proving ground. Mm. This is where this is where just your testimony comes. Th- that's why I have a testimony mm. of the life of this church. Mm. You know, of of going to work at twelve midnight. Mm. You know, and working sixteen hours, and then coming home and kissing these kids as they go to bed, or something ridiculous. You know, and. Um, making something like $7 and 50 cents an hour. And if I come to work on time and I'm not 15 minutes, 15 minutes late, I get another dollar. Well, you better believe it with a wife and three kids that I'm not going to be late 15 minutes. Cause that $1 means everything to me mm-hmm. and them sitting down and once a week, buying them a happy meal mm-hmm. and seeing that Adam doesn't want to finish his happy meal. <laughs> Do you know how long I work for that happy meal boy? <laughs> Yeah. See that that's that's a story. Yeah, for sure. That's a test. Yeah. You know, and I would just I would just say if there was a encouragement to a younger generation is they abort too quickly. Mm. Their pain tolerance is not high. They quit too easy. You know, where's the perseverance of the gospel come mm-hmm. in? Where's what you said, faithful? You're, you're going to get to the place of multiplication, but it's not going to happen until you pass the season of faithfulness. Mm-hmm. And when you're at the verge of questioning everything, doubting everything, wanting to, uh, you know, wonder if God's with you or not, um, but then something just breaks. Mm. It, it, it just breaks. And then you're looking back years from now and say, how could I ever doubt you know, and I'm really enjoying uh, the multiplication stage. But you know what? There was something about that faithfulness stage. It, um, it reminds me uh, of uh, of the movie with uh, with um, where he's stranded on an island uh, with uh, Tom Hanks. Tom yeah. Hanks. Uh, uh, Castaway. 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 <laughs> Perfect. And, and you know, and so many of us are like that. I think in ministry, we've been stranded on an island. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't. I didn't call for this. You know, I didn't sign up for this. Whether it's health related to our children or struggle in our marriage or lack of attendance or a location where our church is at that, that we don't like or 
somebody tries to divide our church or a close friend of ours that we built the church with doesn't like us no more and is on whatever social media they're, they're talking to us, you're on an island. And mm. I, I don't want to be on this island. And you try everything you can, like Tom Hanks, to get off that island. But it's a, it's a piece of an outhouse mm. that's going to get you off. And, and you go past those breaker waters, and you're used to being pushed back every time you've tried it. But this time you get past those breaker waters, and there's a scene where he looks back on the island and there's divided emotions there. Mm. I'm so grateful to be off of that island, but on that island, I found God. Mm. I found myself. And I think that's the season that preachers need to go to starting ministry. Mm. Even if you get everything, you still got to realize there's going to come a point where God is going to stop it. Mm. And, and it's just the love of God that's going to say, okay, now we're going to go through a tough season now. Yeah. And if you'll just be as faithful as you were before and after, then you'll walk into it and you persevere. You just perse you persevere through it. Mm -hmm. I tell people the first time, I mean, uh, I started, we had a, a, a Sunday service uh, from in the house, and then we were there three months, and then we went to an elementary school. When we went to the elementary school three months after being at church, I decided I wanted a Bible study on Wednesday night. So we rented the, uh, the auditorium at the elementary school for Wednesday night. So back then, obviously, I still worked that, but then I'd be going in at midnight or 2 in the morning, Bible study traditionally at 7. So I do everything. I, I load up the little forerunner I have with the mic stand and uh, the, the, the audio equipment and go over there, set up all the chairs, set up the audio, do all that. And 7 o'clock comes, and, or before that, nobody shows up. 7.15 shows up, 7.30, 7.45. Nobody shows up. Mm. And I'm thinking, what am I doing? <laughs> Is this a joke? <laughs> <laughs> what the heck? I thought, like you said, give me a guitar and a Bible and they'll show up. <laughs> yeah. Didn't, isn't God talking to people and say, Diego or Abundant Living is having their first, or it wasn't their first, it was a few, it was, it was maybe the fourth or fifth or sixth one, um, midweek Bible study, go, God, God's there, and, you know, and, and they would show up and they did it. And I mean, I, had, I, that was probably one of the lowest points where I felt discouraged. Mm. I did felt discouraged. But I look back and, and I need that. Mm. I need to look back on what, what did you do the next week? Mm. What did you do the next morning? What did you do three days from now? Well, I got back on the horse and I got back into prayer and I believed God and I maybe didn't have to put another Wednesday message together because I had it from the previous <laughs> so did, did, didn't, it, didn't a guy catch you in the parking lot on the way he out? He did. 7.45, he showed up. Okay, so I'm discouraged. Yeah. I'm mad. I'm, I'm, I, I got to be honest. I'm mad at God. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just mad, period. Mm -hmm. You know? So I reload it, pack everything back up. This is crazy. Seven forty-five. This is crazy. And a guy shows up. <laughs> Pastor, I'm sorry, I'm late. What time is, is church still on? And I thought, Oh Lord, forgive my my doubt, mm. my unbelief, my unbelief. You you did send somebody, not in my time. Mm. And so so I yeah that was a. Uh, hurdle that I got over, so it didn't matter after Sheesh. that. And you opened the back of the truck and gave him the sermon, right? I don't know you something like. No, I, think, I think I did. <laughs> yeah. I gave him the Reader's Digest for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the next week I did have to come up with a new one. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> See, these are the stories that yeah. we don't hear about. No, you know what yeah. I mean? And these are yeah. the things I feel like are life. Yeah. Right. They're yeah. anointed. They're they're yeah. smeared with heaven. You know what yeah. I mean? One one of the things I like to do is like. I like to tell that story to our staff and I say, no matter how hard ministry gets for you guys, you'll always have at least one person in the room. <laughs> and it's because one guy, the founder was willing to put the work in. I said, I said, I've never done something that less than 10 people have come to <laughs> in our church. Right. And I said, the only reason why that's possible is because one guy took the hit to have no one show up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To have that one person come and then him make that decision. So I say, guys, you're gonna, there'll be times you're going to be discouraged with your numbers or whatever, but I'll tell you this, you're never going to not have anyone come. Mm -hmm. And you're blessed for that regard. 
So if, if you now that different a church planner probably has to hear this story and completely <laughs> relate to the whole thing, right? <laughs> but to our staff who get hired on our team, I go the, the reason why I don't get discouraged easily in that sense of like looking at the numbers or the crowd or the people is because I'll never be in the position he was. Sure. Because I would have my personality type, I would have quit the game. One hundred percent. I don't think I, so, I though. Like, I've been maybe, around Adam know, enough but, where but, I'm like. Adam's a church planner. <laughs> he just happens to have. Yeah. He is, he's, a, he's, a, he's a beautiful inheritance. Yeah. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Like Adam works. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh my god! Like yeah. I can't. As a church planner, I can't keep up with Adam. I be coming here. I'm like, what you going to now? What you going to now? And he's like, I got work to do, bro. I'm building yeah. a church. Yeah. And he's so very responsive as your assistant. Like I literally was telling him yesterday. I was like, we get on and we send a Slack or something. He's like, boom, on it. And Alizé and I will talk to each other. I was like, how is he so fast? No, for sure. I, be, I text Adam. I'm like, hey, bro, I know you got a lot going on, but I was just wondering if we could talk about this. Hit me when you have time. Boom, he calls me. I'm like, yo, you're good. He's like, hey, man, I'm driving. What's good, bro? I'm checking <laughs> in. Uh, what, do you need anything? I'm like, oh, it makes sense, right? Because yeah, when right. I see successful people, now we go from you know faithfulness to fruitfulness. When you pop the hood, it makes sense. Yeah, it's because there's hour-long faithfulness, sacrificial love. There's tears and sweat, and people might think it was handed to them, but in reality, when I'm around Adam and even the team here, I'm like, oh, Adam, <laughs> he was built for this. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. what it feels like to me. Yeah, you know what I mean. So. Yeah, thank you for that. Well, and we want to go from church, one church plant together, right? We want to do what 500. Is that, the, is that the goal? That, that, that is a conviction I have. I know yeah, that's your we, goal. We be talking about it, bro. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I was telling Jimmy while we're walking, he's like, oh, by the way, we're starting a church plan network with Adam. <laughs> he's like, what? <laughs> FYI, you might hear it on the podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That, do it, do it. You know, one time, I not too long ago, I was uh, had the pl- privilege of uh, talking to Tommy Barnett. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, I, I asked Tommy. I asked Tommy, "Did you have any regrets? Do you have any regrets?" And you think about his resume of everything that he's done and initiated in the kingdom of God and the cutting edge of whatever it is, Dream Center, the bus ministry, or theatrical stuff. Um, he just said that I wish I would have done more. I, I built too small. I thought too small. Wow. So if somebody that magnitude could do that, think that way then we need to just continue. If it's 500, it is 500, and I'm not going to you know, be bashful about it or, yeah. or, or grimace. It's, it's 500, and God likes that kind of give me the mountain kind of thing, yeah. like, like Caleb and things like that. So Yeah, yeah. sometimes I, I'm learning, like, I just need permission by mm-hmm. being around other crazy people. Yeah. Because sometimes, like, when you're the tallest person in the room, you think you dream big, and then you come across somebody else, and you're like, oh, this is, this is my floor. And then you're like, oh, man, I just need permission yeah, yeah. to have faith. And even the Bible, a mustard seed that's going to become a tree where the birds of the nations come, right? And mm-hmm. is the, the Jews at the time, the disciples were like, this small little faith, is it really going to reach, you know, Judea, Galilee, Jerusalem, to the ends of the earth? And he's like, yeah, it is. So like, yeah. Yeah. have faith, have courage. And like one of my current, you know, you, you guys read the book, Hero Maker, Dave Ferguson. Mm-hmm. First time I told him I want to plant 500 churches. He's like, Will, whenever you get, like, scared by the vision, right after that, add a zero behind it. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, I was like, I I was like, 500 is already, like, the zero. zero. I added a zero. (laughs) And he was like, no, Will, like, I could see you planning 5,000. Don't Mm. limit what God can do. He's like, always add a zero behind whatever God speaks to you. And yeah. I was like, oh, y'all, y'all just crazy. But but just gives <laughs> yeah, me permission, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, and then yeah. another friend of mine, he was talking to a pr- pretty prominent pastor. And the pastor told him, son, your dream should be so big that other people find their dreams in yours. Have a type, Be the type of leader where you dream so big and you believe in people so much that when people come around you, they find dreams within you, right? Have a vision so big that a, yeah. like a designer could find a dream in your dream. Right, have yeah. a dream so big that someone that does social media could fulfill their dream in yours. Because if you're going to be an apostolic leader, you got to lead a whole community of people, right? So I think being around like people like Pastor Diego, or even being around you, dog, and even Jimmy, this dude's sharp. Like I just go like, okay, let's do this. <laughs> yeah. let's, let's build yeah, God's yeah. kingdom. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's you. Yeah, we were we were in my backyard one day. We were talking about church planning and. I, and I'm like, yeah, man, I want, you know, we're passionate about it. And, you know, we're like kind of talking about it. And then 
Will goes, uh, yeah, I want to do 500 churches one day. And I, and I went, I mean, <laughs> I was thinking maybe like 15, like <laughs> maybe like, and we weren't talking in terms of like, uh, like, uh, Patriot camp is just in general, like yeah, sending yeah, yeah. out church planners and all that stuff like that. Cause we have a, like a, we've had like an internal dream to get to, uh, 10 Patriot campuses, yeah, which yeah, I think yeah, it'll, yeah. it'll be more than that, uh, re, you know, in the future. But when guards are like just sending church planners, it was like, yeah, I could see us doing maybe 50. <laughs> and, then, and then Will's like, I, you know, I want 500. <laughs> I'm trying to do 500. That. And I think my first word was like, how? <laughs> how that, You're like, how does that about, happen? Like micro churches? <laughs> yeah, talking, right. about, talking about meeting in the cafe with three people? I was like, yeah. what are you talking about? Yeah. But then like, I hadn't read Hero Maker at the time. And yeah, then I read yeah, it. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, I understand what, uh, yeah. what, what, what we're talking well, about. Well, I think even with Jimmy, like we yeah. talked about it. Like Jimmy came to me because he was my youth student. I was a youth pastor at 18, and he was 14. And then he comes up to me, and he's like, and, and then at that, probably by the time I was like 24, without exaggeration, probably like 10 plus of my youth kids were now youth pastors. Mm. So it's just been my history since I was young where like, I just raised up pastors. Mm -hmm. but Jimmy came back from New York, and he's like, I want to plant a church. I was like, all right, let's get you to plant a church. And he's like, and I want to, I want to run with you. Like, we're fam. Like you're like you're like my older brother. We've been doing mm -hmm. life together. So my, I believe God's calling me to plant 500 like autonomous churches. But then Jimmy was like, "No, I want to plant beloved. <laughs> like you might. Like yeah. we're we're one DNA." Yeah. I yeah. was like, "All right, dude, let's do it then." You know yeah. What I mean? So not like a bashful or like a humility thing. It's more like a laziness thing. It's like <laughs> why why reinvent the wheel? Why <laughs> come up with a whole new name? Uh, system a vision, system pro just. Copy paste that and let me just do the thing that I care about, which is loving the sheep. And yeah. it's like, I don't have any ego about any of this. I don't need my yeah. own logo, whatever. Yeah. Let's just get all of that logistical stuff out of the way and just focus on the heart stuff. Yeah. yeah. And the crazy thing is, yeah. like, he was serving at a pretty well known church full time, getting a good salary from the job, too. And I was like, Jimmy, we don't got we can't even pay you for residency, bro. <laughs> so I literally told him, yeah. like, don't come because yeah. I love you so much. I've tried to help, and this is all I got for you right now. Mm -hmm. And he was like, no, God's called me. He's like, yeah. I'm, I'm going to do this. So he's tutoring wow. right now. Dang. He's a smart dude, NYU, brilliant kid. Wow. He was a teacher at a public school in Brooklyn for Teach for America while he was youth pastoring. And he was I got this. So right now he's like, I was like, can you come to the party? He's like, oh. Wednesday, I'm tutoring kids online all day, but Thursday, I could show up, you know? So it's like, <laughs> yeah, church yeah. planner right you here, dude. Grind. You just gotta <laughs> grind. find whatever source of income, just grind. <laughs> yeah, for real. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, that's huge. That's yeah. incredible, yeah. I think, yeah, I think, because we, you and I had talked about it early on when we were talking, like, you were talking about autonomous churches in the sense of guy, sending guys off, letting them build their own vision. But I, but I think it does say a lot when... Um, you know, people kind of join a tribe and a mm -hmm. family. And I think people are looking for that uh, nowadays, especially, you know, individuals like us, people of color who are, who are looking for uh, something that they can kind of be a part of that, mm -hmm. it, it, that, that, that American individualistic mindset, I think with Gen Z and even Gen Alpha, that, that core culture of America, I think it's hopefully starting to die off a little bit. I think mm -hmm. that is. is the, you know, we all want to be the king of England. We all want our own kingdom. And, um, you know, I think I think overall that culture, and hopefully it's so, especially in the church world, is dying and it is being a little more uh, participatory and like, sure. hey, let's, let's jump into something together. Sure. When in the past, maybe conversations were like, who's going to be the boss? Who's going to be the man? Who's going to mm -hmm. be the... And then it immediately always became that. And then that's how church splits were just rampant sure. you know back back in the day that um though they happen i don't hear about them as often as i feel like they happened 15 20 years ago sure. um but but yeah I, you know i think i think that's that's great and you even being open because i remember one day you were just like no there's one beloved there's going to be one beloved like yeah, that's it i'll yeah. send other people for other stuff for sure. but even being open-minded to say like but but if that's what someone wants to feel connected to yeah. why why you know why, why starve someone of not for being sure. part of the family or that community type for of sure. thing, right? For sure. Uh, that's pretty dope. Yeah. yeah, I think for me, just it's just it's all about discipleship, right? Because some people use people to build a church, mm -hmm. but my mentality is, no, use the church to build people. And once they're built, if God has a hand on them, release them, empower them. Don't hoard them. Don't hold them. They're not mine, Yeah. right? And 
that's the shift that I think a lot of our generation is kind of more the norm. So like, yeah. Even on our staff, I'm always like, hey, like, look, we're working together as long as God has us together. I would love to have you guys as long as you're here. But at the end of the day, we're building his kingdom. So if God sends you out somewhere, we want to bless you. We want to send you. We want to empower you. We want to resource you. And my yep. job is just to faithfully disciple and steward and love. And yeah. this dude preached. And, like, so many people came up to me and they are like, where is he planting? I was like, oh, why? Yeah. They're like, we want to go with him. <laughs> And I was like across the country and they're like, ah, never mind. Never mind. <laughs> but like I was yeah. telling him, like, hey Jimmy, yeah. if you want to go to LA, we'll send out like hundred people with you. Yeah. yeah make yeah. it easier. And he's yeah. like, I got calling in New York. I was yeah. like, all right, well, you go to New York. I was like, or you could take over this church <laughs> so I can start planning more churches. He's like, yeah. I'm going to New York, you know. So no, we love pain, so we're going to New York. <laughs> yeah, for sure. What area in New York are you guys going to? In Flushing. It's in Queens. Oh, nice. Yeah. It's uh it's like one of the most so I was actually out there for about ten years doing ministry. Um, we actually have like the same spiritual father and he was at 19 he hits me up and he's like hey do you think you have a calling and I was like yeah and he's like okay go to this church he just sends me an address and I was like they don't even know me they've never even heard of me and they're like just go I told them that you're coming so I, I preach a, I don't know it was a terrible sermon I think <laughs> like kids like got into the middle of a fight in the sermon yeah. and I was like okay this was a disaster I'm going back and then they're like we would love to hire you and I was like all right. And then so we just ended up staying there and God would just send sign after sign of confirmation because every moment it got difficult. I was like, I'm going to move back to California. This is terrible. But God just kept confirming and confirming. And I was like, OK. And it kept growing and growing. And eventually it became an unsustainable lifestyle just because I was I was working insane hours and I was just falling into depression and burnout and we were about to get married and just thinking about being a husband becoming a father I was like this is not setting up my family for success I'm gonna be a terrible father I'm gonna be a terrible husband and I, I don't think I'm built like Pastor Diego because I was letting my character flaws come out in my mm -hmm. exhaustion and so we moved back to California and I was like God I want to do a little rehab I want to get my character solid, and then we're going to go back out there. And when the pandemic hit, I still wasn't even sure if I wanted to plant a church in New York. But when the pandemic hit, New York is built a little bit differently because a lot of the churches are smaller communities. We're talking like 50 to 150, mm -hmm. but like hundreds of those instead of one church that has everybody in the community, kind of like California, the way it's built out yeah. here. And so when the pandemic hit, they couldn't financially hold over and so a lot of churches shut down. A lot of, I know 30 guys who were in ministry, they all did boot camp and they all left the ministry mm. and, and went into coding and all of that stuff. Wow. And I was like, oh, maybe I should have done boot camp. <laughs> 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 no, but it, it just kept, God kept confirming inside of me. It's like, we need more people to actually love ministry. And so actually hearing your guys' story, I was like, wow, that's so beautiful that they view it as an inheritance rather than as a curse. Yeah. And people are hungry yeah people are so willing people are so ready and i'm just more excited about flushing now than ever before mm. and i know that it's from god kind of like what you're saying mm. because all the self-doubt that comes through it's still not louder than that confirmation yeah. than that certainty of that calling of we need to be there for the people i don't know how we're going to do it i don't know yeah. if it's even going to be possible but it needs when, to get when you done. guys projected that you might move september out there? 2025 Okay. Yeah. Nice. My my wife is in nursing school right now. And so oh, once she's done, yeah, we're going to move straight out there and we're going to plant. Yeah. Sweet. Man, that's exciting. That's yeah. dope. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is actually like the first time it's getting Is this like the first publicly time uh, <laughs> announced actually? Yeah. Yeah. We got, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> got no other option now. <laughs> <laughs> got to do it yeah, now, yeah, bro. Yeah, right. We might have to delete this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. no, it's going to be like Will's first time. Will had uh, 16 <laughs> edits he wanted from the first episode he ever did. <laughs> oh, Gave hey, us Adam, a list. You know that story about yeah, yeah. Francis Chan? Yeah, can we remove that one? Cut this, cut this, cut this. Can we this? remove this story about that person? I told our editor, he's like, we're going to lose half the show. I'm like, eh, let's do it, man. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's great. Any closing remarks? Anybody got closing? Um, I, I think to piggyback off of uh, of what, what Will had asked when you know about positions like this and successions and mm -hmm. maybe some things that um, uh, don't work well and, and all that. Um, early knowing that he was not an employee, that he was my son and he was going to be the person as you said, 
added an emotional caveat mm. to this relationship kind mm -hmm. of thing. And I could see that in the in the beginning that like when your your children become adults, you know, they're not subordinate to you anymore. They become colleagues mm. and you talk differently and suggest in form than command form. I recognized that was very important or um, I would either drive him out or I'd make him an un unhealthy leader. Mm. So I had to begin to see him as a colleague of mine and not my son or just not an employee. Mm. And that would now change the playing field of respectability, uh, collaboration, and things of that nature. We got into, I would say, maybe three heavy conversations, confrontal, raise your voice, two different opinions. Mm. But after the first one, I'm sure it bothered him to have to or talk to his dad that way, but it bothered me as a father of to course. talk to my son that way. Of course. And I recognized at that point, uh, it was a very critical time to, if this was going to happen or not, by how I handled it. And I told him, I want you to understand that from this moment forward, no matter what the conversation looks like, um, no matter what you say to me, whether I it, polar opposite or I disagree or I don't like it, here's what I promise you, I will never fire you mm. based on what you said. Mm. I will never fire you. And, but here's the promise, or I will not speak truth and I'll back off because I won't hurt you. You've got to promise me that you won't quit no matter what I say. Mm. And if you promise me that no matter what I say, you won't quit, and I promise you that no matter what you say to me, I won't fire you, mm. that's what our relationship would look like in a playing field. Mm. And that's how we marched forward with hard conversations mm. of different styles of how we wanted to do things. And uh, so that I think that that might be what people don't do well. Yeah, that's why people probably fail. Because usually when you hit the wall, it's yeah. either you're out or you push through that yeah. and that the fact that you guys were able to navigate that and then pastor diego the, as a father to in many ways like humble yourself and then yeah. to your son and then to be like you know what he's hearing from god that's i feel like that's just so rare yeah you know what i mean that's yeah. so rare yeah and it was important for me to validate him not that he needed it in front of this congregation to say i was i was 33 years old when i started this church 30 years ago I was 33 years old, okay? I had nine years of experience in ministry as an assistant pastor. I had two years of Bible training under me. You are getting a pastor who, number one, is 33 years old. So you believed in me at 33 years old. Why won't you believe in him at 33 years old? But number two is now the list begins to change because he's got more than nine years mm -hmm. of experience. He's got better education than me, and his gift mix is much more broader. He brings a global perspective, a kingdom perspective. I didn't really bring that kind of respect yeah. to, that, to this church. He has a network of, of things like in marketing and business mm -hmm. and other areas that I didn't bring to this church. And so... Uh, it was important for me to, oh, the people say, wow, that's right. So it's not nepotism. Mm -hmm. It's not nepotism, for sure. you know? And that kind of, we, we, I just purposely did that f from day one, dropped those dimes, put that out there so that there's no shock value. There's no yeah. mass exodus taking place. His gift has made room for him. We didn't shock the people. That's why this thing is not going to be a big shock that we're having when we announce everything, people will be more shocked by the name than you know. Yeah, that like yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's the biggest thing, and you know, and that's really all we're talking about. You know, it really on the and night. And then probably the me asking him um, about a year and a half ago, two years ago, when I hand this off to me, hat to you, you tell me how you see my how you see my role in this church. Sheesh. I'm not going to tell you how I see my role. You tell me, and that was another pivotal point. Could he see the gift in me? Mm. Would I bring or am I going to validate? send you out to the pasture? Because yeah. <laughs> all the transition cohorts, that's what they recommend. Yeah. They say the, the guy that's passing it off, he has to go out to the pastures. Mm. Like, he has to, you know. And um, Can you break that down? What do you mean go out to the pastures? He can never be around anymore. He Like, he cannot step foot on this campus. Oh, wow. Like, he can't. 
because and most of the time it's because of the the predecessor doesn't know how to not be the lead person anymore so yeah. so they'll come in and they'll i don't like this yeah. move this sit with employees talk to you know if they have pastor friends still on staff like tell me how's the new guy doing <clears throat> and it just starts scoring division or they'll meet with elders and deacons in the sense of like building their own vision or working on their own projects or this or that so they say like they say like the day the baton is passed like that guy had like most of the guys like move away they they go retire they go to florida they go to texas or whatever right so um when my dad when my dad uh uh, two i think two years ago now when he sat you he was basically like if that's what you want me to do I'll do it, but I don't want to do it. Mm-hmm. I don't want to do it. I think there's more in me. I think, you know, my dad's doing this at a younger age than what most guys do it in. They do it in their seventies. He's doing his early sixties. Just... He's got all this life and always on yeah. his bike he working t- out. He took a second job now. He's a chaplain for the sheriffs. You know, like he's, you know, he's still, still grinding away, right? He's traveling different. and preaching everywhere. So, he basically was like, I, I don't, I don't want to go anywhere. Um, and he's like, if you, if you, if you let me apart because we were sp- supposed to still kind of do this in 2027 that was kind of the original goal original mine 10 year 10 year transition and then um i actually gave him a job description a jd it was his first jd in 30 years <laughs> <laughs> i gave if I that gave was him a me JD. i would have been like hey suck it up to me get a lighter and burn it in front of your face <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> So I spent like a week. I said, yeah, I'll think about it. And and then and, and so I basically handed him like a formulated JD <laughs> and, and was just like, hey, you know, like this is this is a this is what I think I'd love to have you help with. And so there was some stuff with some, you know, some of the elder stuff. I asked him, you know, I still wanted him to uh, chair, be on our board, chairman, our board. I wanted him to develop young leaders who I think. Guys our age desperately need. Guys don't have pastors, spiritual fathers really anymore. Mm-hmm. If you do, you're blessed, mm-hmm. you know. So um, there's a lot of that. I wanted him to mentor campus pastors in the future. I wanted to make sure him make sure that we still had, uh, uh, because we are a charismatic church, I wanted him to be the barometer mm-hmm. of our spiritual nature. So making sure we still um, administer the gifts, making sure at all the campuses that's happening. Mm. Um, and so, you know, whether that's holding, holding prayer nights or healing nights or mm. uh, whatever that may be. So I kind of had this like job description and, and then my dad looked up and he was like, I like this. I want to, I want to do this. It's like, okay, well, we'll, you know, we'll plan t- leading up till 2027, like when we can start instituting these things. And he was like, no, I want to, I want to do this right now. Mm. Like he, he, he's like, and he just, however he worded it, he was like, I'm done with all, <laughs> all this, you know, like, he's like, I don't want to know how youth numbers are doing. I don't want to know what's going on in children's ministry. I don't need to know if we're out of diapers. I don't want to know, you know, I don't want to know what, you know, the small group, all the stuff that you know as a pastor yeah. is healthy. Right. It's just like that your energy level weans from that, you know, and, um, and so, uh, yeah, he said that, and he's like, I like this, I like this, like, let's do it. And then we were like, originally, you were like, let's do it, and it was September, you said, let's maybe run towards this in January, and I was like, well, let's, uh, no, let's do a well, year well, and a half, yeah. like, let's <laughs> well, do a little, here's a huge you know? point, <laughs> this is the first Good Friday and Easter service that I didn't do in 30 years. Wow. So some That's things wild. are easy to give up. HR, going to meetings, knowing diapers. I could That's give that up stuff. in a That's heartbeat. Not fun stuff. But now you're yeah. giving you're giving up the bread and butter. Mm. You want me to give you the pulpit on Easter or not give it to you? I choose yeah, to yeah, want to do it. Good Friday? You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's what it's about. You know, God gave me 30 years to be a senior pastor. Why would I give him anything less? Mm. My son. If I want to shorten it with by twenty, I mean he ought, he ought to have the amount of years that I had mm-hmm. to succeed. So that was always in the back of my head. If I go longer, longer, yeah, I got a lot of fuel in my tank. I could still bring it, but uh, I, I want to hit him at his peak, and I want to give him longevity. So That's beautiful, yeah. I have a yeah. question. This is more like on the relationship side as we close. So what have you guys seen in your wives as characteristics that have helped sustain these like last few years as your church planting or like transition, you know? So just as somebody who is like single and is like, oh my gosh, like these are the characteristics as a wife that, you know, will help my husband, whether they're in the corporate or stay at home, whatever it is, just like... Yeah. Relationship wise, we see this side of you guys' business and church, but what about relationship wise with your wives? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I for me, I think with Ashley, like, um, one of the things I'm blessed in is is to to have, and I can't say that's for everyone. Is is uh, Ashley does believe in me more than I believe in myself, mm. and so like that's a m- massive blessing. So she 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 does think that I'm called, and she does uh, believe in me, and uh, and uh, on top of that, she has. Uh, just as much work ethic as I do. So, so, um, and it's applied differently for her, but you know, she was a professional soccer player at one point in her life. So she understands uh, work ethic and determination and what it takes to sacrifice to be the, your best version of yourself, right? Not successful, just the best version of you of what you could be. And so, and so her and I just have to have a high level of communication on, on what that looks like. So, um, you know, for her and, and, and for me, what I really needed was I needed a great mom. And so, um, she's a great mom to our boys. If, 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 uh, I was just talking to, to my grandma actually, and I don't know if you've had this conversation with grandma, but last week I got to spend time with my, with my dad's mom. We spent all day and my, my kids were with their great grandma. And so it was fun. We did a lot of pictures, but I was having a lot of conversation with my, my, my grandma. And she said, um, she told uh, grandpa when you were about four or five that she wanted to go get a full-time job. And I, and I said, well, that was like, that would have been in the sixties. That's rare for a woman to have had a, a full-time job. And, uh, and she, <laughs> and she said, yeah, yeah. Um, it, uh, it was. And she goes now that I, cause I'm now like digging, like what, where's that come from? Where's that desire? And she said, I guess now that I'm thinking about it, she said, when I was, uh, when I was, uh, she either said 13 or 16. She said, when I was 16 years old, I had a teacher in elementary school. And she said she was, she was a white teacher and I was failing on, uh, in class. And she said, she came and sat next to me at my table. And, um, she said, you know, sweetie, I know your grades are terrible and you're failing, but don't worry about it because people like you, (laughs) they don't get careers and jobs. Um, you're just going to have kids one day and just stay home. So it really doesn't matter what your grades are or not. That's crazy. You know? And so she said, she tapped her and said, you'll be fine. Don't, don't think too hard about this stuff. And like for my grandma, she's like, no, I'm thinking about, I think that set a determination because she married my grandpa at uh, 18, 16, 18. Um, Uh, Let's see. They had me when I was 18. So she got married at 17. So she got married at 17. So this, maybe this happened at 15 and then she's married at 17 and by time she's 21, she's telling my grandpa, I, I want to go to, she went to, she went to work first and then she went back to school. And then she ended her career as the highest executive administrator of, uh, she was the, um, executive assistant to the superintendent of an, of a whole school district. Mm. It was just like a really high coveted role within the, within school districts. And so, um, all that to say, like me hearing that from my grandma and understanding like what certain aspects were important to her and work ethic wise. And she would say how like my grandpa would, he was working two jobs at the same time too. So they had to like use babysitters and all this stuff to help with my dad. It's like, to me, it's just, it's just understanding from your spouse, where are your desires coming from? And are we on the same page? Because I'm then asking my grandma, like, did that cause conflict with you and grandpa and all this stuff because you really want to set a name for yourself and he's obviously working two jobs. And so I think what's important on like a wife's side that isn't just our own personal stories. It's like, like for me with Ashley, Ashley was completely fine. And she talks about it all the time saying, why don't you be Michael Jordan? I'll be Scottie Pippen, you know, but, but some wives may want to be Michael Jordan. And I, and I've had friends that have had wives that want to be Michael Jordan and there is can't always be two Michael Jordans in the home. And so it's just having that understanding and that conversation. I grew up with my mom being a stay at home mom. So I had my mom in my house pretty much every day. My dad, for a lot of his time, he didn't have his mom in his house because she wouldn't work. So it's that dynamic of what does it take to sacrifice to get to the goals together. And so me and Ashley, I just feel above anything, her and I really, you wouldn't hear two different answers from us. If you talk to her, right. we really Unity. succinct in that, in that regard. And then, and I think that's why I am able to be super responsive or whatever that is, because she's not giving me flack for being on my phone. Cause we're, we are unified in that idea. And I do know when to rest well with her. And so I make sure I listen to her and, you know, understand where she's at in that regard. That's kind of the 
two cents I would give towards it. Yeah. yeah. I love that. Mine's simple. My wife, <clears throat> she just loves me so well, dude. <laughs> she just knows how to love me, dude. And we work together, like you and Ashley. So yeah. my you wife just posted, right? You've been together for. We've been together 14 years, but nine, nine years, <laughs> nine years anniversary, and she's yep. she's just a. She just loves me so well, and we we co-founded a church, so she runs the church, all the operations. She runs our staff meetings. So we just yeah, and then we just she just loves me well, dude. That's good. That's yeah. good. <laughs> like, I feel so like sorry so towards her, dude. Yeah. I look at her, I'm I'm so sorry you married me. <laughs> like I'm thankful and sorry. Like you could have married someone yeah, so yeah, less. Yeah. Yeah. With issues, you know, but <laughs> I'm just thankful, dude. So. I do the opposite with Ashley. I look here, I go, you're so blessed. <laughs> <laughs> you're so freaking blessed. That's what blessed. I really mean, though. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's reverse psychology. I tell you know? that all the time. <laughs> like, you, man, you won the lottery. <laughs> you're so blessed. I mean, I'm a, I, I help with the kids. I, I make dinner. I'm like, you're just like... It's like a princess. You lucked out, man. <laughs> I've been telling Andrea, you know, there's a guy named Andrew Tate. You should listen to him. He'll help our marriage. <laughs> no, you <laughs> didn't. I do say that as a joke. I'm like, you should enroll in something called Hustlers yeah. University. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It'll be good for you, honey. And she just, she just <laughs> talks trash. So funny. Oh, that's awesome. Well, thanks for sharing that. Yeah. All right, everybody. Thank you guys for joining and tuning in to Beyond the Letter. Appreciate you guys once again. Jimmy, Will, Dad. Yep. Thank you for being on today. It was a blast. Look forward to the next one. Love Bye. It. Bye.